G'day everybody, it's Annette Denton with Live with Obsessed and I'm joined here this evening by Adam Whittington. He's the CEO and founder of the not-for-profit charity Project Rescue Children and Child Abduction Recovery International. Adam, thank you for joining me tonight. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Oh, that's okay. Oh, my God, I can hear you. That I think Best that's crossed, a yeah. thing to happen all day. Okay. So, we're going to have a pretty full-on chat tonight, so I just want to warn anybody who is tuning in, there's a trigger warning. We're going to talk about some pretty heavy topics, child sexual abuse, trafficking, online safety, the dark web. So if you're going to be triggered, I'm just letting you know now um, because I don't want you to come back at me and say, hey, you didn't warn me. So, Adam, for those who are kind of like going, Adam Whittington, I think I've heard of his name before. Um, so you're involved in um, an attempted rescue a few years ago um, in Lebanon and things kind of went a little bit wrong, didn't they? And you ended up in prison for um, four years in Beirut. Four months. Four, four months. months. Four months. Four yeah. years is a long time. Thank God it wasn't four years. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. Um. Like, how, what was it like? I mean, I can't even begin to imagine. Uh, well, it's, it's a massive story. Uh, obviously, anybody who was following it uh, in 2016, um, for all the right or wrong reasons. Um, but uh, it, was just a, it was just a situation that absolutely blew out of proportion with the media. Uh, it was like... Uh, absolutely unbelievable with the mainstream media mostly australian who just blew everything out of proportion uh incorrect information nobody to this day has even spoke the truth of actually what happened so you know um it's a reason why i don't watch media it's a reason why i pay no attention to mainstream media uh i learned very quickly when i was inside prison and i was being shown certain uh things that were being written from my lawyers. Uh, most of the things my lawyers wouldn't even show me because they knew it was just defamatory and, and just complete lies. So when you when you were dealing with a, a major, major uh, media outlet like Channel 9, 60 Minutes, um, you, you know things aren't going to be told uh, the correct way. So so it was a, you know, and funny, funny to this day, uh, I've been writing a book about it and um everything keeps getting updated so it's been four years um i have no intention to write the book for money it's about getting the truth out and and showing people exactly what happened um but because it's an ongoing case um, there still has been no trial um things keep getting updated and um in particular a really important thing which nobody knows about uh, which I was going to explain to your viewers, was that there was so much corruption. Now, Lebanon, anybody who knows Lebanon and, and works in Lebanon, um, it's one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Uh, and I knew that. Um, but when things started to happen and the investigation started with the with the judge, the investigative judge and the police, I could see and I was... I was listening and seeing so much lies and just so much corruption, um, especially from the father, the kidnapping father uh, and his family towards the investigative judge who were very close families, uh, both Shia Muslims. Um, no disrespect to Shia Muslims because I have some amazing friends who are Muslim, Shia, whatever. But because they are connected, uh, we knew there was a lot of corruption. So, so basically what's happened in the last 10 months which no mainstream media has even touched on, considering how much of a big story it was. Yeah, was funny that, that. The actual, yeah, well, you know, they, they write what they want to write. Um, but basically, the investigative judge who charged everyone with a kidnapping felony uh, has actually been off. Uh, he's been uh, investigated for corruption. So he's been dismissed. Uh, from his position as a as a prosecutor and a judge and he's been basically told to go home and he has been for 10 months so 
this is a massive thing for anybody who's following the case because I've been shouting out corruption from day one, you know, and, and people don't understand that the, the, the whole job um, of, of trying to help those two kids, you know, and there's not, there's not many days I still, it's four years on, and there's not many days I still don't think about those two kids because for me, it's all about the kids. And uh, I, I go through it all the time and it, there's, there's nothing we would change from what we did. Um, absolutely nothing at all. Everything went to plan. But when you have outside uh, influences and people sabotaging, uh, contacting police to look for specific people, um, that's it. I mean, that's exactly what happened. It's in the book. Uh, there's, there's undisputed evidence to show that it was sabotaged by a competitor um, who lost the job originally. So, um, so basically the that's, that's the story. The sad yeah, thing sorry. is, is at the heart of this is is the heart of of all or anything to do with trafficking and pedophilia is the kids, are the innocent Absolutely. victims here, aren't they? And you've got these media oh. outlets and corrupt officials and people who just aren't thinking about the children. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so this this news is uh, quite important for the case because, firstly, we can't we should not have been charged with a felony kidnapping. Uh, it's it's there's a precedent already set in Lebanese law, which we knew before we went that as long as the parent is with you, you can't kidnap your own children. So it should have been just charged as a, a misdemeanor, but because this father was paid off by the the uh, the judge was paid off by the father. Uh, to stick on felony uh, charges. That's what happened. But now he's been taken out. Um, so this is a big a big uh, thing for the case. That's a big deal. And it took you quite a few months when you got back to remove all those defamatory media articles, yeah. didn't you, by the Australian yeah. media? And, like, how much does that sabotage your reputation? Because this is something you've been doing for a long time, isn't it? 21 years? Yeah. You've been rescuing. Yeah, we've been doing this. We've been doing this for over twenty-one years. Um, you know, I've sat with governments, the British government, the, the Australian DFAT government, uh, discussing how to prevent child abduction. Um, it's uh, it's just a topic that uh, you know. And then you get the, the the media involved, and all they want to do is print fancy headlines. Um, um, it's just it's just ridiculous. So we spent two, three months with my Australian lawyers and we removed 26 defamatory articles. Uh, they were both, you know, the Kyle and Jackie O radio show uh, that was removed, multiple media uh, news articles, radio shows, TV interviews, all taken offline because it was defamatory. So, um, and then obviously we've had to deal with Channel 9 themselves, you know, complete assholes. Um, and uh, that's life basically so yeah but if i if i had my way i spent i spent a little bit of time with the two kids sally faulkner's kids uh and sally you know great mother uh what's happened to her is just horrendous and she's not alone there's thousands of mothers and fathers like sally around the world that we try and help um and i think you know in 21 years we've returned or oh, just over 200 and i think seven or ten children uh who have been kidnapped like that so the media won't report on that. The media just want to report on one case. Um, but uh, it's what sells, apparently. Well, yeah, well, and it was anybody who watched. It was pretty dramatic. And it was almost like I remember watching it thinking it was almost seemed orchestrated to be dramatic that way. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we th th there's nothing we would have done different. I mean, it was a situation where we had to go into a Hezbollah-controlled area um, so our, our surveillance and everything months and months before was done perfectly and we knew exactly what had to be done and it was done. Uh, unfortunately, kidnapping parents, even if you had legal documents stating that this child must be returned to the mother or father, the kidnappers refused to do that. So we work a lot now with courts where they actually give us power of attorney to use reasonable force to take the children with the parent um, so our names and details will be added to a court order 
uh, in those cases because some judges who have half a brain, they understand that the kidnapper will not just go, there you go. So what you saw was, you know, we planned and, and thought many different options was the only and safest way. Now, the media said it was all dangerous. It was complete nonsense. There was nobody around. Uh, we planned it very well. And, and all we had to do was get the two kids on the boat, uh, which was the easiest part. Um, and that's when it got sabotaged. So it's like. Oh, I know, but it's heartbreaking to think that, you know, there's a mother who's still without her children. And like, you, you, I think you just said that you had rescued over 200 children. Yeah. How many children yeah. haven't been rescued? Because you said that there's thousands. Is this happening yeah. every yeah. year? It's Well, listen, we're talking about pandemics. You know, there's pandemics. You've got child exploitation, trafficking, but you've also got kidnapping. You know, the, the amount of kidnap, the, our, my company, uh, Carrie, is just so overwhelmed with jobs from parents all around the world who the system, they just, uh, the system's failing them. There is no system to return kidnapped children. And that's why parents like Sally look, look for people like us, uh, legitimate people, organisations like us. There's not many out there. And we do our best uh, for the children. I know for a fact, because I sat there with the two children, with Sally, when we got them in the safe house, they do not want to be in Lebanon um, and they miss their mother extremely much. So it's it's, it's, uh, it's child abuse. Basically, what these kidnappers do is, is just blatant child abuse. Well, it's not done out of love, is it? Because it really no. seems to be a way to get back at the other parent it's all in the do. most horrible it's way. Difficult. It's all they do. The, 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 we, we basically say it, uh, children are being used as weapons against the other parent, and that's all it is. And there is no legal system um, to return these kids. You know, you have the Hague Convention, which is not worth the paper it's written on. I mean, most of our clients are successful in the Hague Convention to return. Both courts in both countries say this child must be returned, or children. Um, there is zero, zero enforcement. And that's where we come in. So many of our jobs are 100% are legal. Um, we just we just assist and find the children because they're usually being hidden. Uh, and we return them with or without the police when we have the court orders. So you were saying it sounds like there's a, a lot that goes into um, extracting these children, mm. almost like a, a military operation yeah. that you have exactly to work out. Yeah. yeah. Well, you do without have a background weapons, as a exactly. soldier, don't you? Yeah, I spent four years in the Australian Army um, as a soldier, which, uh, you know, you learn a lot quickly. So, um, but most of our guys are ex-military or ex-police um, as well. So you don't need those skills, but it does help um, because our biggest job in these kidnapping cases is the extraction. Uh, we've, we've extracted children from countries you wouldn't believe uh, and we just can't tell you because uh, a lot of our clients stay confidential. They stay private. Um, unfortunately, some parents do decide to go into the media. Um, personally, and from our experience, it's not the right move. Um, but some parents have no other option and they want to get their story heard in, in the attempt that they think the governments or, or police will, will act because they're in the media. It doesn't work like that doesn't work like that so it just seems to make it more volatile well what you do what they don't realize is the first thing you do when you, you go into the an article about your kids being kidnapped is you piss off the kidnapper uh that's the first thing you do and and obviously once you do that there goes all lines of communication um so some parents don't understand why that kidnappers cut them off with skype calls and stuff like this well you've just gone into the media and basically made the other parent, the kidnapper, look bad. So it's best just to stay out of the media. You know, if you want to go in the media, go in after the children's back so you can raise awareness. Uh, but don't go in before. That's my advice to anybody listening. So now you, you said that this is probably the biggest pandemic that we are facing and that it's been going on for centuries. So when we're talking about the pandemic, are you, are you talking about like, trafficking overall because you said to me before that actually falls under a number of different areas it does yeah human trafficking you know um 
basically in 2000, we, because we travel a lot with Carey, the, the kidnapping cases, uh, we often saw many trafficking incidents, uh, ch children getting abused, but we couldn't do anything because we were there for a different reason. So we were doing surveillance on, on kidnapping children. So in 2015, it took us a year to, to try and come up with what can we do separate from Carey, like completely, um, to help these children who are being trafficked and, and sexually abused and all these different types of things. And in 2015, that's when we came up with PRC, Project Rescue Children. So obviously we start, I started it in the UK. It was only very small. Uh, and then Lebanon happened. Uh, now Lebanon was a was a good thing for some some uh, some reasons because I, I've actually used Lebanon uh, to try and build uh, PRC uh, with the attention etc. So you know I've had meetings now with um, the AFP assistant commissioner, the AFP commander in charge of human trafficking, uh, Darren Hinch. Um, we're trying to lobby and change things in Australia as well as overseas. So. In a way, I've tried to use a bad negative situation from Lebanon into a positive for PRC. And PRC now, we operate in uh, Kenya, Australia, Ro uh, Romania, Myanmar, and also um, Russia. Did I say Russia? No, um, you did they? So we work closely with the authorities and we partner with other not for profit registered charities. Um, and so since 2016, when I got released, I actually concentrated more on PRC than Kerry. I mean, Kerry now is still flat out. It's just it's phenomenal. I mean, the, the COVID-19 uh, COVID has stopped all child abductions instantly. Obviously, people can't travel. But what it's done, COVID-19, which I've been screaming from day one, when before most countries started stopping borders and all this, it's... It's turned uh, child sexual abuse, human trafficking in different ways. It's a tsunami, honestly. It's absolutely out of this planet. And and the thing that shits me is, like, where is the outrage? Where is the screaming from people about child sexual abuse? You know, pedophiles love COVID-19. It's their best friend. So where is the why is that? Why is, why is it their well, best you've friend? Got, you've got restrictions. I mean, for how many months in many countries? Um, I'm not too sure. Australia, I think people were allowed to leave their houses. In in many European countries, there was complete lockdown, and you could not leave your front door. So what? Put yourself in a in a in a child, a young child who's been raped and sexually abused by a parent paedophile. The only freedom they had was when they go to school or, or get outside. COVID-19 stopped all that. These kids have absolutely zero freedom and they're inside 24 seven for how many months until some of these countries removed complete lockdown with a pedophile. Right, right, right. I mean, where is the outcry? Um, so it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's just a it's just a pandemic that nobody nobody wants to listen or talk about. So, yeah. Why do you think we don't want to talk about it? Because to me, as a parent, it's horrific to think you know. And I'd like to touch on the dark web with you and and grooming children. Not right yet, but as a parent, this is something that is insidious and heinous. Yeah. And I would hate to think of any child I know that was experiencing this. So why why do we shy away from being outraged about this? You know, I've been I've been looking at some of the comments and that about the post you did the other day about that. You know, um, there is no easy answer. Uh, all people are different, um, but it is a it is a problem, and and this is why. Uh, I I I quite I'm quite outspoken with this on my social media. Uh, as to why people stay silent when they know something's happening or, or they turn a blind eye or, you know, I, I, when I meet people for the first time who don't know what I do and they ask, well, so what do you do? I usually say something different. You know, I, I, I 
clean the streets or something, you know, or I'm a plumber or something like this because it's not a barbecue so conversation, times, is it? No, no. <laughs> but when I do, when they do start asking about, you know, what I do and I get into details so many times, don't want to hear Adam, don't want to hear it. And, and there is no easy answer. I guess there's different, different aspects from different people, whether they're shy about the topic or they're too scared uh, or they're, they just, they live in their own bubble. I think too many people live in their own bubble and they, they're not interested unless it's happening to them. You know, if it happened to their child, that'd be first, first on the phone to me, Adam, how can we help? You know, um, so it's not an easy, it's not easy an answer really to be honest. Do you think people But it's something feel... that needs to change. Oh, absolutely. Do you think people feel ineffectual? Because it's like, what can I do to change this? Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like we look around the world at the moment and there's so much going on where you just think, mm. I'm just I'm just being buffeted by all of this bad news. Yeah. So yeah. what do I choose to focus on? It's true. It's a very good question, actually, because it's a topic that you can't just instantly do something. Uh, you know, you see a homeless person on the street or, or an old lady crossing the street, you can do something instantly. Um, this topic, you can't. Um, so we ask, we get, we get flooded with requests for help and how can we help? And we just say the number one, the number one thing that I think most people can do instantly is raise awareness. Um, you have to speak out. You know, I see so much shit on social media. I really, I, I really hate it, but it's a necessity. But there's so much shit that people post when they could be just posting, you know, about this pandemic. Um, again, it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. But oh, that's a that really good point. Need to raise, yeah, yeah. I Raising see awareness people. is the number one, one number one reason, uh, number one thing people should do instantly, even now after this raise awareness you know post human trafficking what can we do because because i can tell you what uh the higher up people australian politicians don't get me started on those um absolute muppets uh, <laughs> don't want to hear anything uh you know I've, I've i've been in correspondence with julie bishop um um who she was when she was the foreign minister um and uh we wrote a few letters back and forth and, and she acknowledged PRC and what we're doing. And, and um, it's basically, yeah, we provide funds to foreign countries. Listen, I, my, my passion is to get on the ground and, and see what's going on and, and get involved. No fucking funding goes to these kids. No, no funding from foreign countries go, go to helping on the ground where it helps. So where is all this funding? The millions of dollars, you know, so, yeah, sorry, I went off there. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's why we're talking. I mean, this is all about raising awareness because the, the people that we vote in to look after our interests and protect our communities and our society often seem to be feathering their own nests and pushing their own agendas when right. we're saying this is stuff that we think that you really need to do something about and they're not. Don't blame me for being yeah. frustrated. You want to bang their heads together and go, oh, listen here, listen, Peanut. I'm, oh, it's absolutely true. And listen, I've been, I'm, you know, the what is it, New South Wales Child Safety Minister, Gareth, his name, Ward, I think he's, he's banned me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I smash him on Twitter and uh, I give it to Morrison and all of them. And, and as an example... What was it? Just a week ago, there was a vote. Now, this is absurd and absolutely drove me nuts. It was a vote for mandatory, a new law for mandatory uh, life and sentence for child abusers. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, it should have been a 60, what is it, 64-0 uh, vote. Every politician should have voted for it. It was a 32-32 vote. The Labor Party, whoever they are, listen, I don't even follow politics, but the Labor Party all voted against it with some other Muppets. So it was a 32-32 vote. So that meant the law, the new law, that the, the bill uh, was rejected. Or why? This is talking about putting pedophiles away for life. A a and child safety, they don't want to hear about it because there's no votes, right? Child safety issue is not a, is not a voting topic for politicians. They don't care. But it wasn't, it was about 48 hours later, there was so much uproar. 
um, and I gave it to them on Twitter as well. And um, the the uh, people who voted against it voted for it. Um, so it actually did pass uh, a few days later. But that just shows you the mentality of politicians. You know, there should be no acting like kindergarten kids when they're in their, you know, political house down in Canberra. It's They just act like kids, you know, and no interest except their own agenda. So how, how do we, how can we help? What What is it that we, you know, like me and Hayley and the people who are listening to this and the people that we share this conversation with, what can we do to help? Like I know that you really want to push for tougher laws that will either see pedophiles and child murderers locked up for life or in countries that have the death sentence to apply the death sentence. But how, how can we put pressure on them? It's just raising awareness. People have to talk about it. You know, sitting at your barbecue, having, you know, barbecue dinner with family, you've got to talk about it. And, and this is a way kids will learn as well because kids, you know, one of the biggest problems is online grooming from paedophiles. And, and we're talking, we're going straight into people's houses now because people have their blinkers on and think it's only, it's only happening outside or in, in foreign countries. Bullshit. It's happening right now in, I reckon, 90% of houses in Australia where kids are playing Fortnite, Roblox, all these chat, anything with a chat on a game, kids are getting groomed. I'm telling you now. And uh, I know for a fact because we do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, we do a lot of different things to try and catch pedophiles. Um, and one of them is we have a lot of fake profiles that we, we lure uh, the paedophiles, uh, pretending that we are a 12-year-old girl or a 13-year-old boy. Uh, and we build a case against them and we give that information to to the authorities to take over. So, so it's raising what, awareness. How are they grooming? How are they grooming our kids? Because, like, what is it that parents should be looking out for? Uh, well, firstly, you've got to take control of what, what your kid's doing online. If you don't know who your kids are talking to, the number one rule I always, and even to my two boys who are really good, um, but still I watch them, is kids must be taught unless you've met that person, you know, in real life, don't chat with them. Don't chat with them. That's the number one rule. And then, and then things can get quite safe then. But as soon as kids start talking or chatting to what they think is another 13, 14-year-old boy, when it really it's a it's a it's an adult male and they grew up listen these pedophiles there's so much misconception with pedophiles pedophiles are not 50 year old with gray hair and a fat beer belly they're not um the trend from what we've been seeing um even the afp came out with it not not too long ago the disturbing thing is pedophiles are getting younger and the victims are getting younger so we're talking infants you know, who are, who are getting raped and sexually abused. And um, so people have to get out this stereotype that pedophiles are old great men. There's women too, right? There's many, many women who are getting arrested now for, for pedophilia. Uh, so um, raising awareness, watching what your kids are doing, talking. You have to talk to your kids. You have to. Do not be shy or scared about this topic. You need to teach the kids uh, about online safety because trust me pedophiles are very smart majority of them you obviously you get your, your dickheads who are just you know uh, not so intelligent but majority of the ones that we deal with um, they're extremely intelligent they're extremely tech savvy uh, they know what they're doing and um, they'll groom your kid within a, a week sometimes quicker sometimes a month two three months a year they'll groom uh, until they're satisfied and until they get a meeting, you know. So yeah. what does grooming look like? I mean, you, you've mentioned it a few times. How does yeah. that show up for, you know, well, like they is do. it? Well, it's, well, there's no, there's no like, obviously uh, for what it is, it's, there's no um, warning signs or you can't, you can't see it because they're so good at it. But you, they try and target vulnerable kids. Vulnerable kids are are the worst uh, to be targeted. 
uh, and that could be a lonely child who hasn't done, doesn't have too many friends as an example and a pedophile will come along and you know and this is why it's important kids get all their information off their facebook page and like where they live and and their family members and dogs and cats because pedophiles will look at their if they get their name they'll look on social media and do a google search and go really in depth or snapchat and they'll they'll profile the child so what they've got now they'll put all the information together about this child okay she's a single child mum and dad are divorced uh all this information she doesn't have too many friends um and and they'll they'll basically just use that as a tool to make that child feel safe comfortable beautiful important. uh important and they build a relationship just like you meet somebody on say tinder or a dating site you they build a relationship and this is what the grooming is all about it's not just saying okay let's go down we'll meet you at the park at five o'clock it's not like that it's it's they're really sophisticated and parents need to understand that mm, it's not just sophisticated that's so manipulative and yeah like I, as you were describing that I actually felt a little bit sick because they're taking advantage of people that are meant to be protected by our society and these yeah. these yeah. oh the just just What's, vile I mean, creatures I mean, it is and is and this is why um you know you have apps some apps are shocking we are all of my guys are on the apps we all have different profiles so i have you know i'm a, I'm a 12 year old girl and a 14 year old boy and a, and a whatever um so we have apps like kick you know, I could show you how we can connect with a pedophile within five, 10 minutes from our profiles, from our fake profiles. And it's just shocking. It's just shocking. I can't put it on social media, the chats. Um, but what we do do is hand it to the police once we build a case. Uh, and I sat with the head of the child protection unit in Gold Coast two years ago. I had a meeting with, with him and, um, I can tell you they they try and do a good job as far as online abuse you have um um but they're so understaffed um he turned around to me and said adam you probably know more about trafficking than me um so you have this as well it's a struggle for the authorities and the afb just came out recently and just said you know it's it's such a tsunami it's such a pandemic that they can't keep up with it uh, there was well, an article they, two days ago. They need ago, to, like, don't right? they? But that's the thing, you know, people point the finger at the police. Uh, and sometimes, yeah, it's true. They don't do enough investigation, but they, they're so understaffed. And a lot of them are, are not skilled in this field. Um, it, there's so many pedophiles. People need to really, there was an article two days ago I was shown. I didn't read, but someone showed me and, and uh, 180 registered pedophiles in townsville alone that is monitored or unmonitored by two police officers uh so these pedophiles roam around free don't don't think for a second they don't reoffend. uh anybody who tells me that uh, a pedophile won't reoffend, i'll give you a slap because it's not true and this well, is why I, I i no this is why I, I there's no other justice except uh life in prison without parole without parole stick them on an island like Nauru or something, get rid of the internet and just leave them there for the rest of their life or the death sentence. It's the only two options. You can't put a pedophile, a pedophile back in the community. You cannot. Well, that's kind of why when you hear stories about prison, you know, that they're, they're considered rock spiders and, that you know, like it, with murderers and, and, and other people who've committed atrocious crimes, they are the worst of the worst, e yeah. even amongst... Yeah you know, the people who've done really bad things. Um, someone mm. wanted to ask, uh, Hayley, what do you think of um, Omegle? Omegle? Is that a yeah. new app, is it? Or It must be. There's so, there's so but... many apps. Listen, uh, all I can say is anything with a chat, you've got to be careful. You've got to really be careful. Even dating sites. Uh, we, try and, we try and deal with children. But we're, we're helping more and more women now who are being human trafficked. As an example, just touching base on, on apps, Tinder. 
people think it's just a whatever you know sex app dating site whatever tinder we we are dealing with more and more cases as an example uh russian women being lured and groomed by turkish men they get into a relationship on tinder they fly to turkey passports are taken off them they use as sex slaves we are working with authorities in particular the russian authorities uh to get a lot of these women out of turkey because the turkish authorities are not interested so you have a lot of the this is a simple case um but uh people have to understand that human trafficking the whole sub subject is is the fastest growing illegal trade in the world and it's the second most profitable behind the drugs so it's estimated 150 billion dollars is, is made by human trafficking so we're talking women for sex children for sex um women for you know d domestic type of slavery mm. works like we so it there really seems to be a bit of a theme here that it's women and children that are, yeah. are being victimized am i wrong yeah it's 90 percent correct yeah obviously men there's uh you know trafficking always also includes forced labor uh, body parts, you know, human body parts, um, sexual exploitation, obviously. Um, and another one that's it's fairly new is live streaming um, child abuse. So so there are men obviously more in the forced labor. Uh, and a lot of that is is countries like Kenyans or Indians or, or those sort of countries getting taken to the Middle East. As an example, you know, the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, everybody's glitz and glamour, right? You've got to look look deeper. Look at how many Russian prostitutes are there forced trafficked. Look at how many forced labour Indian men are working on the construction sites. Have a look there for five minutes, and you'll see nearly a hundred percent of the of the construction sites are Indian, Bangladesh, Pakistan. What gets done? Nothing. Nothing, because we look, we walk around like this, don't we? Mm, because big money. It, it, yeah, mm, big so money, you're, you have you, corruption. You mentioned um, organ trafficking. Is mm. is that like the wealthy going? You know, hang on, I need a new kidney. Um, it'd be easy just to take someone from a third world country so that I can use their organs. It's a big business. It's a it's a million dollar business. Um, there's all different reasons. Um, obviously, some people can't have access to to medical hospitals, etc. So they go underground, black market, and that's where it all is. Um, you know, it happens in obviously poverty stricken countries. Um, Europe, Europe is. I mean, we work very much in Romania, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, and what I've seen with my own eyes, Romania is ground zero for human trafficking in all of Europe ground zero from kids women and mostly and, and some men um all those beggars and stuff you see in all those capital cities paris and berlin and uh, london all romanian they're all trafficked um so it's a it's a, it's a big topic big topic mm. oh i don't even i don't think we can do justice we would have to talk for weeks i think mm. Mm. To, so when when these people, the, the, the children, the, the women and the men who are being trafficked are rescued, what happens to them? You know, like, uh, aren't they still uh, potentially victims that can be reabsorbed back into whatever pathway? Yeah, absolutely true. Uh, and this is another big problem too, rehabilitation. You know, education, rehabilitation, housing them in safe safe uh i oh know we, we do a lot with our partners uh in myanmar which is shocking uh the world has no interest in myanmar which is used to be burma uh, the amount of trafficking and, and stuff going on there with kids and women into bangladesh china uh is at home it's absolutely shocking um but what we try and do is put them with registered um other NGOs who have connections with safe houses and um, things like that within their um, within their areas and towns, so they can be rehabilitated and taken care of. And um, that's a goal for PRC too. Once we raise quite a bit of money, we're going to build our own safe houses. 
uh, which will house children and women. Uh, also, we will recruit uh, local staff and, and educate teachers and, and psychologists and doctors and stuff too. So that's a goal for the future. It sounds like a big goal. Can, yep. can we touch on the dark web? Um, you know, like I, I think the only thing I know about it is just what I've seen on movies or seen it mentioned. Again, it's a topic that, you know, mainstream media never really touches on. But how does the dark web factor into this massive topic that, we, that we're talking about? Yeah, well, basically it's a, it's a very in-depth in uh, thing, the dark web. But basically see the dark web as the brain behind human trafficking, exploitation, body parts, uh, everything. The brain is the dark web. Um, you can forget about Googling child sexual images and, and, and stuff like this on Amazon, uh, sorry, um, Safari and Google. Forget about that. Uh, the, the serious stuff is on the dark web and uh, you need special... Uh, you know, downloading special um, apps and stuff to, to get on there. And I'm not going to tell you which ones because I don't want people going on there. Yeah, uh, I don't want to know. It's, it's just it's just, it's just a, a place you don't want to be because it's, it's not only all that. It's also, you know, people's bank accounts you can buy. You can buy PayPal accounts, fake passports, guns, drugs, everything you can think of. It's like a shop. Think of Amazon inside the dark web. You can get anything. You can hire hitmen um, to do to do what you want. But child, so what we do, we have uh, we work very closely with our Russian colleagues, uh, and they're IT experts. Uh, people probably know them more as hackers. Um, they're great. They're great. So we we have them constantly in the dark web, searching for child exploitation material. Um, it's not child porn. I. I fucking hate media who always, always, and this is another concept. The media put out so much shit that people think it's really, it's not child porn. It's, it's child sexual abuse material. It's child rape. You know, porn is when, you know, two people consent and they're having sex, whatever. Kids don't do that. So I hate the word, the term child porn. Um, but, but still journalists to this day still use child porn. You it see, Minimises it, doesn't it? Uh, shocking. Um, so anyway, the dark web is is somewhere uh, you can basically get really horrific stuff. And it was only last week that our team uncovered uh, some shocking images uh, of, we're not 100%, but we know the child's between four and six. And we took, it took us all night looking at these images and minuting, you know, the background and all this sort of stuff to try and identify where they what, what country at least what country uh and it took us all night i didn't sleep all night i was working with the russian guys and some others and we identified where the country where it is and we passed all the information to the authority the, the appropriate authorities and they're working on it now so this is what we do um but it's a horrific place that really um you just don't want to go in there to be honest because uh, once you go in there they can start hacking your stuff and and uh, you've got to be really, you've got to know what you're doing. It's, it sounds like you're being dipped in the ultimate poison by going really in there. It is. It yeah. is. And, and, and there's, you know, body parts and, and stuff, not too expensive, you know. Uh, kids, images, um, you know, you've got to be careful what, what pictures or images you post on Facebook too, even, even innocent you know, a big a big one for pedophiles is is school uniform, kids in school mm. uniform, right? So you get all these mums and dads posting back to school images on their Facebook, right? And it's still open to the world. They don't, you know, have their settings set for private. And these are used in in other because pedophiles have different different pedophiles have specific craziness, right? So you have pedophiles who love kids in nappies. Right, and they'll masturbate over this. You have ki pedophiles who who like little boys in school uniform, so they'll image these. They'll look at your kids, and they'll they'll masturbate right on your on images from your kid. People don't understand. It's not just naked, naked kids. Uh, so you've got to be careful what you post. Oh, they're, dis oh, they're disgusting creatures. 
Oh, I, 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 like I'm almost like speechless to think that yeah. the that the scope of of what this is is just yeah. massive, Adam. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> That's <laughs> like you're usually, telling me all of these things, and my I'm like, phone going, usually is off. Yeah, yeah. I like mean, it's you, just a, it's just a thing. I mean, even if they go to prison and the and the conviction rate, like this is what people have to understand too. Is is uh, the prosecution and conviction rate for child trafficking, even human trafficking exploitation, is so low, it's non existent. Like two or three percent, if that, of traffickers get convicted, charged, and convicted. So, this is why human trafficking is becoming the number one fastest growing well, it is fastest growing uh, illegal trade. It's passing drugs because drug traffickers are seeing. How profitable human trafficking is, and and you take a you take a bag of cocaine, a little satchel of cocaine, and you take a child or a woman. How many times can you use the the, the bag of drugs? Once. Well, once it's yeah. gone, once you snort it, it's gone. It's right? gone. But a woman or a child is. Yeah, you can rape a child and woman 10, 20 times a day, and that's that's profit. Yeah. So you you got to. This is why a lot of drug. We know we know drug syndicates that are moving more from drugs to human trafficking. There's a better profit and margin only, in it. Oh, absolutely! And you only need to look at, you know, uh, the Mediterranean or the the North Africans um, coming across into Europe. The, the 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 drug trade in Italy, as an example, and and Spain, they're moving more towards. They want a piece of the human trafficking money. Mm. Uh, like Haley just asked a great question. Do th do they really want to stop this? Do governments really want to stop that? Because uh, is there a bit of money being passed backwards and forwards here to protect these people? Oh, listen, you know, there's always corruption. Um, I've seen it firsthand in government in foreign countries, and you know, sometimes we take cases absolutely 100% bulletproof case of a child being raped or trafficked uh, in a poverty-stricken country, they won't do anything. And we know for a fact that uh, places like Myanmar and Cambodia, uh, governments, the officials take money. So I also know for a fact that in Cambodia, you try and take a case to the authorities, the child protection units, they want money before they even investigate. So it, 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 it kind of blows your mind to think yeah. what is the value of a human life? Mm. Because mm -hmm. to you and I, we would place it as an extremely high value, but to these, to governments who are doing nothing and to yeah. The criminals who are doing this, they really are just a transaction. Yeah. I mean, I don't think governments like Australia and all that, I, I, I can't say because I haven't seen, but I knew in, I know in uh, poverty stricken countries, corruption is thrives and, and traffickers and the pimps, you know, doing this to kids are protected because they have money. Simple as that. Anybody who says it doesn't happen, you're a liar, you know, or come, come with me and my team for a day or two and show you. So what? So, so I mean, I've asked you this question, but I, I think I'll repeat it in terms of, like, what can we do to help you and your organisation? Do you need volunteers? Do you need money? Um, do you need us to write letters? Do you need us to have more interviews like this where we can like shine the light on this topic yeah. Yeah. to All like wait, shake people? You need volunteers. Yeah. All all of the above. I mean, volunteers, we have over 30, we have 32 now volunteers uh, and nobody makes a salary. I don't get any money. Uh, nobody on PRC gets any money because when I started PRC in 2015, I did a bit of research on others and I didn't want, you know, PRC, I wanted PRC to be focused on areas that are being ignored. You know, there's a lot of spotlight on Southeast Asia but I can tell you there's other countries, as an example, Kenya, um, Romania, it's so much worse than Southeast Asia. Um, horrific, horrific uh, cases of sex tourism 
Western pedophiles going in in droves to places like Mombasa, buying kids and just walking on the streets holding the little kids' hands while they rape them, you know, every night or whatever it is. And and it's being ignored. So so much awareness needs I mean, so many of these talks need to happen. You know, we can't operate without funding, um, which is what we're we're talking a lot with uh, Australian officials as well. Um, we've also just teamed up with um, Aboriginal elders in the in the community of Warrumbinda in Queensland. Um, it's the first we're the first ever charity to actually be partnered with a group of Aboriginal elders because they're sick of the Australian government ignoring them child sexual abuse in these communities is right uh, and nobody does anything you know government gives funding to specific charities within australia aborigine people do not see one cent of it so i met them uh we've had a few meetings we built up a bit of trust so now we partner with the elders directly um in an attempt to get some funding which goes directly to the aboriginal people and we have two programs um that I can't say too much about, but it's basically programs to educate Aborigine communities using Aborigine people, uh, which we have three amazing volunteers on our team. Um, and we're using their culture mixed with uh, educating child sexual abuse and, and other things to, to be taught to them. So we've got a lot of things going on um, in that aspect as well. We're also working we have a program in Kenya, as an example. Um, we're taking the the child. Uh, what is it called? The old safer neighborhood system um, uh, that used to see in communities. Yep. Well, we're taking that. And we're going to we're going to introduce this into hotels because what you get you get a lot of pedophiles checking in on their sex tourism holidays, rape holidays, and they're abusing, raping the kids in the hotels. So we're we're going to well we have started. We're going to start educating the hotel staff to identify uh, triggers and, and signs of a child with a pedophile uh, and connect with the authorities to report it uh, through us. A lot so of the, uh, this, this is internationally. Does this type yeah. of thing, do, do, do pedophiles have rape holidays in Australia? No. Not, no. 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 It's more they go overseas. Yeah. Well, listen, like I said before, a lot of spotlights on, on Southeast Asia. So what we want to do, and which is why I wanted to uh, start PRC, is to follow the trend of the pedophiles. So what you get now for, for a lot of years, a lot of attention has been on Thailand and, and stuff like that. We, we don't deal with brothels and, and, and places like this because we don't, um, you know, a lot of the women in these brothels want to be there. Um, so we don't see the point in going in and trying to get them out and then they just go back in. Um, so we try and deal with more in depth stuff. So this is why we follow the trend. So what you do, you have a lot of media attention on Thailand, as an example, the, 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 the big pedophiles, the big players, as we call them, they go somewhere else like Mombasa, um, and places like that where there is zero attention and they're free to do what they want. So we like to follow the trend. So we don't concentrate on one specific area. Sneaky fuckers. Yeah, very yes. much. So are, are the ages of children getting younger or that these people have always had a, eclectic tastes across children's ages? Well, we're finding from, from cases that are, uh, we deal with as well as the authorities, um, both are getting younger, the, the paedophile and the victim. Um, as an example, another example, when I was in Myanmar, I've been to Myanmar a couple of times and we, we partnered with great, great guys there that I can't say their name because, um, they'd have told me not to, but, uh, Myanmar is such a dangerous country anyway. Um, so what you have there, you have young girls who are being taken across the border from Myanmar to China. The Chinese families are, are, are buying them, trafficking them. The father is raping the young girls to fall pregnant and they mul they do it multiple times, get locked up in rooms until the girl's pregnant. Once the Myanmar girl gives birth, the family keeps the baby and either gets rid of the, the child, teenage girl, 
uh, kills her or sends her back to Myanmar, which just doesn't usually happen anyway. So where is the media? Where, where's the outcry? And this is, no. this is, we're talking not one or two, you know, and on the border you have Myanmar and Chinese authorities who are involved. And but even, also, even stuff like what happened with Epstein Island, there's still not a lot, you know, like that, that's a, a fairly well-known um, example but there's still not a lot said about it. It seems to always yeah. be brushed under the carpet because these are powerful men who've got yep. big bucks. Absolutely. It is a very powerful, uh, uh, a lot of money involved, as, you, as you've seen with the Epson thing. Um, but you have countries who are doing, you know, and, and you listen, I hate politicians, um, and, and maybe some people will turn off when I say, but what Trump has done for forget about everything else, but what he's doing for trafficking and, and stuff like this is great. And other countries should follow that because um, he's making a big impact and, and the Americans are now very proactive for human trafficking, exploitation. Other countries, Australia? Put your head Not down. Not so much. Course, honestly. Yeah. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. The yeah. UK, same thing. Embarrassing. Oh, had am I just like, I'm I'm ropeable. I'm it, like it's. Uh, this has always been a topic that's I felt really strongly about and quite powerless to do anything about. And maybe what you're doing and and with you educating and informing us here is that we kind of do need to get a little bit angry about this, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I've started a petition. Well, PRC started a petition to after the COVID restrictions and that are being removed. We're asking for people to volunteer to, to rally in Australia. Very peaceful rallies. They don't have to be big, but we're trying to make a statement to the government. You know, you need to pull your finger out because it's it's not only an international thing, it's a domestic thing. You know, you have social services and that that take children off, off families and stuff. Um, it's so rife. It's such a big topic. Um, child safety in Australia, who are supposed to protect children. It's shocking. It's shocking. You know, there was a little, the little girl, uh, Willow, done was murdered a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Uh, no, a while ago. Um, uh, I know the, the lead, one of the lead investigators on, on that case, very personal. And they told me even veteran police officers uh, who will be in the child safety unit for 20 plus years have never seen anything like it. And then you have child safety ministers like Di Farmer who absolutely should be ejected from her position and and held accountable. So many children come under the child safety banner and, and, and spotlight, and these kids are getting raped and murdered, and child safety do nothing. There's no accountability, no accountability at all from the government. Politicians, you see them on Twitter when I give it to them. They, they just ignore it. Right. And then you have I have media uh, following me and stuff and they all like it. And, and you can see that this is I get personal messages from big media journalists. Adam, don't stop these government. This government needs to be aware. So some people don't like me because I'm vocal about it. But, I mean, come on. It's a topic that everybody should be shouting about, shouting about. And then you have innocent kids like Willow, who, who child safety were aware of all the issues. And she was murdered. Mm. And, 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 and you, you you get these fleeting mentions in the newspaper or online about oh. other kids. I remember there was another kid up at Caboolture in Queensland a few years ago known to child safety and yeah. ended up dead because they did nothing. And it's a, well, I think an it's absolute. Like, absolutely. I think it was like 45 kids who in the last few years or something that have been killed. Under the eye, under the spotlight of child safety. This is just Queensland, you know. Um, where is the outcry? Where where is the accountability of these child safety staff and and ministers like Di Farmer, the child safety minister, who stands in front of a camera, you know, and, and talks but does nothing at all. And I know that because I know specific cases have crossed her desk of child abuse, uh, and she refuses to acknowledge anything. So what do you do? What I mean, do you do? Uh, well. I'm so, looking at the comments tonight and I think that we might have a few people that would be like ready and willing to 
peacefully protest this and bring awareness and continue to speak out. And I definitely know that Obsessed With will continue to have conversations with people like you to to wake people up. It's like, come on, people. Yeah. These are our yeah. kids. These are our women. These are people who are vulnerable, who deserve to be protected and not forgotten. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I mean, as viewers watching this or whatever, you know, um, I'd love to go into more detail. I just, I'd probably be banned because it's some shocking, horrific stuff that that most of the world do not see, media do not report on. And if they do report on a case, as, as like Willow's case, it's in the media for one or two days and then it's gone, forgotten about. You know, um, the judge will give the sentence of a, of a miserable sentence to, to the abuser or, or the pedophile. Um, it's just a never-ending circle, but it's something we won't stop. Um, you know, I, I get attacked by pedophiles a lot uh, online. Uh, I have hate pages uh everything uh against me from pedophiles uh so if you want to work in this industry you, you need to be prepared to take uh a lot of shit but i like those haters so as long as they're concentrating on me and not kids online it's good so, yeah i know i know when i was sussing you out for this interview i came across a few of those pages and i'm yeah, like going all, all right i think uh, the lady doth protest too much because yeah. if you put that much effort into attacking someone who's trying to clean up yeah. this shit, then I think yeah. you've got some stuff that you're trying to hide. Yeah, there's always something, always something. But listen, it's part of the game. It's a game that that I won't stop. And I know my team who are amazing um, from the volunteers and everybody who, who just love helping kids. And, and that's why we do this. Um, but there needs to be much more outcry. There needs to be so much more done um it's just not getting done and and but we'll keep pushing buttons and and stirring the pot um to the authorities but um, yeah you know well i i think we will do you have like um template letters um that we can share with people that they can send sure. To sure. their local members, and because I, th I sometimes yeah. I think that's why people don't act because they don't know what to say. It's hard to yeah. articulate yeah. their rage and um, the the sense of like let's yeah. do something. So if we can yeah. share that with our audience, then Absolutely. we might be able to get a few more voices. Um, I, I can remember many years ago when I worked for one of the mainstream media. I could, you know, one of our jobs was to sit in the police radio room. So we had scanners and there was always call it like every single night, you know, five, 10, 15 call outs for domestic violence. And I remember asking one of the senior journalists, like, why don't we ever do stories? Because that woman last night was killed. You know, she was murdered, but there was no mention of her in the paper. Yeah. And the word yeah. was is that we don't do stories on domestic violence because, yeah. you know, it's too upsetting for people. So same with sexual abuse. Yeah. Same, same with sexual, sexual abuse. abuse. So that's yeah. what I think happens is they don't run yeah. these stories because yeah. they're trying to sway us with, I don't know, Beyonce's latest Nobel Peace Prize or, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. that is, with that trivial Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. And and I, I've got three very close journalists and they're quite big in Australia. I mean, I won't say their names because everybody you know them. Uh, we, we, we communicate often and uh, I ask them the same question. Why don't you just fucking write about this? But Adam, we love you. We, we'd love to, but we'll lose our job. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's so much shit going on and, and um, you know, we can only do what we do, but we're trying to expand into into places that is horrific for me going into a, a small town and 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 not much is going on it's not I, I like to see that you know I for me my passion and, and obsession I'm obsessed with uh, getting into places nobody's heard about and where there's horrific things happening to kids and uh, we've just been approved by uh, the police commissioner and the governor of a of a village called Kisimu, which is in the west side of our Kenya, on the Victorian Lake, 
And we're going to go, as soon as the restrictions are removed, we're going to go there and, and uh, work with the authorities because they've just given us a permission. They love what we do and, and uh, they want us to help. Uh, and and uh, a role or two that I do as well, being ex-police in the Met in London for a few years, uh, I also educate police in these poverty-stricken countries on how to obtain and keep uh, forensic evidence, uh, which they don't have a clue. They don't have evidence. So th this is these cases of child rape go to court. There's no evidence. So we do so much. Uh, we could spend all day talking about what we do, but as an example, Kisumu, the, 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 the county, let's just say it's the same size as Brisbane, a little bit smaller. Uh, from January to to May this year, because of the COVID, we're talking about COVID before, uh, 3,964 3, pregnancies. Those pregnancies oh, are girls. Shit. Wait for it. Those, those pregnancies are girls between 10 and 14. These are government statistics that just came out. 10 to 14-year-old girls. And that, I'm, I'm awesome at mathematics, not, <laughs> but that is 26 girls, 26 girls between 10 and 14 years pregnant every day. Where's the outcry? Where is this? Where is the nothing? So well, that's our I next didn't, place. I didn't know about it until you told me. Yeah, most people. It's, it's just how it is. It's just how it is. And and I actually posted a, a, a very good image Last week, I think it was on my Facebook, my public Facebook page, uh, Adam Whittington, PRC, Kerry, whatever it is. And it's an image of a of, of media with a camera pointing to, you know, these riots going on and all this sort of stuff. And in the corner, there's a big elephant and it's, you know, human trafficking, child abuse is being ignored by the media. And it's had such a massive response um, that uh, it just sometimes pictures speak a thousand words. Well, I'm going to pop the link to your public Facebook page in the comments of this interview. Um, I know that we could keep talking um, and I would love to, but I've really got to go to the loo and I can't believe I just <laughs> told everybody that. That's okay. Me too. But that's the, the type of media that we are. Yeah. No, that's fine. It's, I mean, it's it's just it's good to, to actually talk to. Listen, after Lebanon, I... I um, I, I have a policy. I don't talk to mainstream media. Um, so it's good to, to, to speak to guys like you uh, to try and get the message out there. Uh, but something has to be done, and, and we're trying our best to, to help kids in any situation. Um, well, you, you have got fans in us. Um, I just, if I had a hat on, I'd take it off to you. I think that you're an incredible human and we need more humans like you who just go, you know what, fuck this, I'm going to put myself on the line and I'm going to make a difference. And, yeah. and, and you certainly well, did that. That's what you've got to do. You've got to do that, don't you? I mean, just speaking calmly about the topic doesn't work. You, you have to, you have to re reality needs to be shared. And whether that offends people, whether I use offensive words, I don't care because... At the end of the day, if I can get through to some thickhead that thinks pedophiles uh, can be placed back into the community, well, you're fucking mistaken because um, it's all about kids. You know, it's a pandemic that's been happening for centuries. It's not just now. And, and yeah. And, and we can... The toilet. And we can be... Oh, look, I am the mother of two children, so, you know... <laughs> I do have some self control. <laughs> Next topic. <laughs> Next time. But uh, I guess that we have the vaccine for how we can like prevent this and, and get on top of it. And that's us speaking out. It's supporting you. And um, I just had someone say, um, could you come back on another time so that we yeah, can, sure. maybe we might have the conversation a little bit later so that we. Yeah can talk about things that, you know, because we are in a PG time slot in Australia, that we can um, get get a little bit deeper and, and you know, sure. we've got so many people who've been commenting here who are just going, what can we do? We want to know more yeah. and we want to yeah. make a difference. And there's so many. I don't know if you've been watching the comments down the side. No, but I, 
I can't see. No. Go back. No. There's so many people going how incredible you are. And I know you don't do this for people to go how incredible you are, but you know, it's I'm not interested. You know, it's not. I'm not really mm. interested in it. And and but unfortunately, I'm the I'm the ugly face that has to be speaking to people. Most of my team don't get seen, um, and that's how we like it. We're not in it for the media, but we also understand we need the media, people like you, to get the real message out instead of fucking Muppets like the mainstream media who will you give the story and they edit everything to fit what they want, and it's not getting the story out there. So it's great to talk to people like you guys, uh, and I'm happy to speak as many times you want really because uh it's definitely need needs to be told and and you know um we've only just touched on it yeah well let's like once we get off and you guys don't get to hear our awesome conversations after the interview is we'll organize another time and we'll let everybody know who's watching adam thank you so much for your time today and um no oh, god i've learned so much i think my head's and i'm actually sitting here shaking because it's like <laughs> I'm I'm angry, I'm shocked, I'm mortified, but I'm also a little excited that, that there's something that I can do to help. Yeah, sure. All I can say is people watching it, if you're interested, you know, just, just raise awareness. I mean, there's nothing you can do immediately, but it's as simple as sharing posts, liking posts and just sharing, uh, you know, what we do. Have a look at our website, um, www.projectrescuechildren.org. Uh, there's a lot of information on there um so yeah i know it's a i know it's a tough subject but you know we've got to well, speak out but we don't grow and we don't change if we don't face yeah. the tough stuff yeah. do we yeah and, and this is unfortunately this is a topic that you need to confront people you need to be upfront. i can't sit here and say yes human trafficking is very bad and it's not a good thing for kids that's not going to work people need to be shocked uh, and I'm happy to shock you. I mean, what I've just talked about now in the last hour is just touching on it. If you want me to go into specific details, I'll go into specific details. You know, how pedophiles stick fingers up children's asses and stuff, and, and they think it's okay. I'll talk about this if you want, uh, because nobody else does. Um, but that's another time. Yep, we will have that conversation, absolutely. I'm putting the links, people, here into the comments of the website, Adam's Facebook page, and again, Adam, thank you so much. And um, you'll de we'll, we'll definitely be talking again. Awesome. It was a pleasure, yeah? Go to the toilet. <laughs>